Stopping gamers. My onions have been running pretty slow lately. And that got me thinking. What happens when a person runs fast? They get hot. So through the transitive property, the harder I make the NES, the faster it will What the hell it broke? But what does that mean? Normally the definition is pretty simple. This is fixed, now it's broken. But with video games, you'll often hear things like this item's broken or this character breaks the game. But it's still working just fine. Or sometimes the game can't be played, but the physical game is still intact. And sometimes it's all just completely f up. So is this broken and this is fixed? Or is this broken and this is just broken plus? With video games, the definition of broken is a little more complicated. But the way I see it, there's four general layers it can fall into. The first layer is jank. And this is also the hardest layer to describe. It just kind of means the game's f***. It's not necessarily broken in a traditional sense. The game devs created the game to work this way. But damn, did that work have a giant asterisk barely right next to it. Maybe the controls feel off, but the camera's just not working right. Or maybe it's something else entirely. You can't even really show jank on video. But when you're there in the moment, and what you're doing with the controller just isn't matching what's happening on the screen, you can definitely feel jank. For example, let's take Mario 64. Every aspect of this game was meticulously crafted. Every jump, every enemy placement, Mario's very movement was perfectly designed to be as fun as possible so that Nintendo could say to the world, this is the next big step in gaming. And they stepped right into dog sh with that camera. It's just so annoying trying to position it where you want while it's also moving on its own. It, it feels like you're fighting with the camera more than anything in the level. If you play TikTok clock, you know what I mean. With the messed up perspective, even going in a straight line is hard here. It's not necessarily that broken, it's just a relic of its time. Jank is most prevalent in older games, or games like Mario 64 that take big steps in gaming. Cause developers just kinda don't know what to do yet. Coding's hard, you can't just slap some stuff together and expect to make a Xenoblade. So you have to learn from people who have done it before you. But when no one's done it before you, you just kinda have to depend on trial and error and hope some dips and then complain about it 20 years later. So we end up with an era of cameras that are hard to control, or jumps that feel too floaty or too heavy. It can make it more interesting to go back to older games though, because each generation kind of have its own style of jank that you can feel as you play. With something like this in mind, would it be fair to say a game like Mario 64 is one of the worst 3D Marios just because the camera's janky? Yes. This is also where I classify something like a broken item or character. They work just fine on their own, it's only once placed into a wider game as a whole that problem arise. The word of the day is balancing. Even with all the knowledge in the world on what makes a character feel good to control or what's acceptable challenge versus bullshit, it's still hard to create a bunch of different aspects of a game that work together instead of tearing each other apart. Like, could you imagine how hard it is to make a Pokemon? You have to make it good and worth using on its own, but not interact with one of the other thousands of Pokemon in a way that completely destroys the competitive scene. And doing that's easier than you think. Like when creating Diamond and Pearl, some guy thought, Hey, I'm gonna make this Pokemon dog cry, and I'm gonna give it this edgy lore about how it's the Nightmare Pokemon. And to fit with that, I'm gonna give it its own signature move, Dark Void. The only move in all of Pokemon that can put all opponents to sleep. Sure, this will make the opponent unable to attack for turns on end in a game where every turn matters, but hey, Dark Void can only be gotten through going to certain in person events, and any Pokemon that can't be caught in game is usually banned anyways, so it doesn't matter. But oh no, though, nine years earlier, some other guy created the Pokemon Smeargle, a Pokemon whose signature move sketch allows it to learn any move it's even other Pokemon news. And suddenly your entire game is a napping competition, not the dogfight simulator you wanted. Of course though, people think of a broken character, they don't think about Pokemon. They think about fighting games. Mostly because when a fighting game character is broken, the community doesn't shut the f*** up. 
fuck up about it. Like, remember when Smash Ultimate first released and everyone was complaining about how broken King K. Rool was? He's a heavyweight, he has super armor, command grabs, 148 horsepower, and 4,900 RPM. He needs to be banned. But then after a month, no one cared anymore. This is because sometimes the character's not broken because they were balanced poorly, and it's just because people don't know how to play against them yet. After a month, people learned how to take out K. Rool, and then he was just another fighter. My players did have a reason to be concerned, though. Especially after the Brawl competitive scene was completely destroyed by Meta Knight and Bayonetta and Smash 4 was just... absurd. But thankfully, that didn't happen with Smash Ultimate. Minecraft Steve. The entire competitive scene was thrown into chaos because of Minecraft fucking Steven. Now Steve was added in the Smash Bros DLC and it's normal to see poorly balanced DLC characters. People are paying extra money for them, so there's a lot of pressure on devs to make them good, and sometimes they overcompensate a little. People complained earlier in the DLC when Joker got released, but then the same thing happened with K. Rool, where people learned to beat him and he just became another fighter. But with Steve, things were different, because instead of things dying down, he started winning tournaments, and people were mad about it. They wanted this guy banned. And then on the other side, you had people who believed in survival of the fittest. You either learn to beat Steve, or you lose. It's the way of the world. And then the worst thing that could happen did. Things hit Twitter. And then all out war broke out in the Smash Ultimate community for a while. And when the dust settled, some tournaments banned Steve. If I was in the competitive scene, I could see this being a concern. You dedicate your life to a game. You don't want to see it just get ruined because one character is overpowered. Or you don't want to see tournaments banning every slightly annoying character. In my personal opinion, I think it's kind of funny. I mean, one of the most controversial characters in fighting game history is Minecraft f***ing Steven. Having overpowered things isn't always a bad thing though. Sometimes the idea of creating an overpowered character can drop people in. This is commonly referred to as min-maxing, creating the optimal combination of abilities, skills, items, or whatever the fuck to make yourself as broken as possible. It's common in RPGs or MMOs that give people a lot of options on how they want to play. My favorite example is in Xenoblade Chronicles 2, where with the right combination of blades, ox cords, and equipment, you can meet the final boss in under a minute. While at level 1, broken items are also a common reward for doing a lot in the game. For example, in Terraria, if you collect 10 swords from throughout the game, including two that can only be gone at the drop from the final boss, you can create the Zenith, a sword that absolutely obliterates everything in its path. My only problem with items like this are, you've beaten the game, there's nothing left in your path to obliterate. I had a similar problem when playing The Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask. In it, if you collect every mask from throughout the game, you can get the Fierce Deity Mask. A mask so strong, that it can only be used in boss fights. And boy, when you use it, you absolutely destroy whatever you touch. While this game at least lets you use it against the final boss, it makes the fight feel too easy and honestly, kind of underwhelming. Being made during the early era of 3D when developers were still trying to figure that stuff out, the game also comes with a certain level of jank by default. But who cares though, cause all your problems can be solved by a remake. With Majora's Mask 3D fixing a lot of the jank present in the original, and being widely considered worse because of it. So if jank is bad for a game, why is the remake considered worse for fixing it? Well, to understand we gotta go back to BSA BTK11, locally known as 1998. Shigeru Miyamoto and Eiji Aonuma had just finished creating The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time. Now, Shigeru Miyamoto wanted to create an expansion for the game with remix temple designs. But Anuma said, these designs, they're already as good as they can get. We're gonna spend all this time creating new temple designs that are as good as the old ones. We might as well just make a new game. So Miyamoto said, alright, you got one year. One year later, Majora's Mask was born. The product of an insane crunch period, if we used a lot of Ocarina of Time's assets, they can place in an alternate dimension. 
the photos you will use as it took place in a time loop, so that locations, dialogue, and quests could all be reused each cycle. While this design was a product of a short development, it really helped you see into the lives of the people of Termina and put you into this world, creating a Zelda game unlike any other that Alnuma absolutely hated. Turns out creating a whole game in one year they just creating another one is really hard and the insane crunch time might have just been a little bit traumatic for our Numa. So instead of seeing all the things people like about Majora's Mask, you just see its flaws. So when you have to recreate it for the 3DS, he greatly overpatched it. Most obvious example is the Zora swimming. It's hard to control at first, but once you learn it's really fast and fun to use. But all our Numa saw was a flawed mechanic. So he instead made it this really slow and annoying paddle. Or how about him patching the Deku so that it gains momentum slower? This makes it easier to control on land, but makes certain jumps to land with your original momentum way harder, ironically making it feel jankier than the original. Jank is a fickle mistress, bringing games down or under the right circumstances, lifting them up. And for one, 13 month period from 2000 2001, the conditions were just right. With the perfect mixture of talented game designers and extremely abusive Soul Destroy and Crunch coming together to create a game born entirely of jank. With one of the longest lasting competitive scenes in video game history, I'm of course talking about. It features such jank as the Luigi Ladder, allowing two Luigi players to float off into the sky, never to be seen again. Or how about the Wobble, an infinite Ice Climbers combo that can only be ended if the Ice Climber player messes up or they get a kill. Or how about every character having 3D hitboxes despite it being a 2D fighter, leading to such scenario as this. But these players have learned to master the jank and bend it to their will. But this game rides a fine line. Because while some of Melee's oddities are definitely jank, some go deeper into a next layer of brokenness. Glitches. This is where brokenness stops being a byproduct of intentional game design and becomes straight up errors in the game's code. For instance, the invisible ceiling glitch. When a character hits a shield, they slide back a bit. But if during this slide they leave the ground, from now until they touch the ground again, at certain points, the vertical velocity can be set to zero, creating the ceiling. This glitch can and has caused people tournaments before. I say it rides a fine line though, because a lot of things can't really be classified one way or the other. A lot of stages in Melee have really f***ed up geometry, like ledges that can block jumps, ledges that are too hard to grab, ledges that you just can barely not run up up, or stages that you can entirely clip through, and then grab ledges from the other side and not a single ledge to do a sick kickflip off of. The dev intended to make stages with just geometry, but they probably didn't intend for you to go through the floor, so which level does it land on? Who knows? While glitches and Jake do have a lot of overlap, glitches tend to have a lot more of a negative connotation. This is because while Jank can break a game, glitches can break a game. The wrong glitch at the wrong time can cost hours of work. For example, in Castlevania Portrait of Ruin, if after the boss fight with death, you immediately skip the cutscene, leave the boss room the door on the left, and re-enter, you'll get completely locked in and have to restart your game and do the boss fight with death again. Now that's not too bad, but what if you instead leave through the door on the right and use the save statue there? Well, because you just saved your game and the only way to progress is through the door on the left, you are now completely locked in and we'll have to restart the whole game. The Legend of Zelda Skyward Sword has a similar glitch, and at the end of the game there's to use three dragon trials. Now, normally you do the water and fire dragons first, but if you instead go straight to the Sunday dragon you have to talk to this fellow. Now this alone does nothing to break the game, but if after completing the Thunder Dragon quest, you go back and talk to him again, he can play with you over and makes the game think you're still doing the Sunday Dragon quest, and since you can only do one dragon quest at a time, you are now completely soft locked. Kinda. Nintendo worked hard on this game. They're not gonna let one rock month you break it. So, just one month after release, they came out with the Skyward Sword Save Data Update Channel, with the sole purpose 
of fixing this glitch. Even now, four years after the Wii Shop channel closed, Nintendo still has some poor server keeping this patch down loadable, as well as the Wii U data transfer channel, just in case. They even have to have a backup system for families without Wi-Fi, where you could mail your Wii into Nintendo to fix it. Now if this system still works, I'll let you know. This was shadowed one of the best and worst things that ever happened to glitches in video games. The post-release patch. It's great for cases like this where you need to just fix one or two glitches to make a game playable, but it also gives companies an excuse to rush out games even more than they already were. Because even if a release is broken, you can just fix it after release. I swear, if Melee came out today, it would have given Sakura like three weeks and it would look like this. The worst of these is the day one patch. But when devs need just a little extra time to fix the game, but discs have to be printed now. One of the most infamous examples of a game releasing unfinished is Cyberpunk 2077. This game had every glitch you could imagine. From randomly clipping through the floor to having messed up NPCs to whatever the hell this is. People were pissed, with Cyberpunk quickly becoming one of the most hated games of all time. But surprisingly, after a ton of patches, the game's actually pretty well received now. All these people say it's because of the patches. I'm pretty sure they just watched the anime, saw some ass, and decided, eh, no bad could it be. The Cyberpunk situation really pisses me off though. Mostly because it's your fault the game was bad! Every time they delayed the game, people would yell at CD Projekt Red to just release it already. And then they do, and people get mad that the game, they said they needed more time to finish, isn't finished yet. Sure, to be fair, they probably shouldn't have announced Cyberpunk the second someone said, Hey, I have a game idea. But people also need to learn to just... Wait. All this rush does is make the game worse encourage companies to have extreme crunch culture. The thing is though, games so glitchy that they're completely broken are kinda rare. Because while all games have glitches, most make you put in the work to find them. And this is where breaking a game becomes an art form. With glitches going from annoyance to something you can use to experience whole new things in games you never could before. For example, in Breath of the Wild, if you activate bullet time and short surfing right as you're about to land on an enemy, before was done the bullet time bounce, sending them flying across the map. Not only does it allow you to travel high world way faster, but you can also just fly across the map way more than you normally could with the glider. Another example is in Donkey Kong 64, where you can clip through the map and reach an area you normally only see in the opening cutscene. These do nothing to affect normal gameplay, but allow you to have fun in ways you normally couldn't. Not all are created equally though, with there being a wide range in how easy or difficult the glitches to pull off. While something like the Minus World glitch in the original Mario World is pretty simple, just needing you to jump backwards at the right time and BAM, you're on a glitchy 7-2. Some of you going, how the f*** did anyone ever find this? There's a glitch in Paper Mario that lets you warp to the end of the game, and to do it you have to name your character this thing of Japanese characters. Are you playing on the Japanese version? You're gonna wanna start playing on the Japanese version. Play up to the King Goomba fight, then save the game. Now, take out Paper Mario and put in Ocarina of Time. Name your save file this string of Japanese characters and play the first five minutes normally until you get to this hallway. Perform a bunch of precise inputs and glitch the camera look like this. Walk over to this crawl space, do a bunch more precise inputs, glitch the camera look like this, and walk blindly back to the hallway, perform some more precise inputs, and the game has crashed. This means you're doing it right. Now switch off the console, take out Ocarina of Time, and put back in Paper Mario. All that shit in Ocarina of Time caused certain code to be stored on the N64 expansion pack's RAM, which will now be run by Paper Mario. You had the expansion pack, right? Because otherwise you're f***ed. Also, depending on your N64, you're also f***ed. Because while the older ones give you like 10 seconds to perform the swap, the newer ones only give you like 10 milliseconds. Now perform a bunch more precise inputs to mess with how the game stores memory, spin in place, use your hand with 75 times, and jump. And the game has crashed. But when you restart it, you are at the end credits. How the f do you find all that? These guys did it, and if you ask them, they'll say, Oh, we looked at the game's ASCII code and coordinate positions and web memory and blah blah blah, they're wizards. However, they find it though, what they find is called ACE, or arbitrary code execution. It means using a bunch of precise game inputs in order to write your own code and run it. This is most commonly used to skip to the end credits of games. 
And you have people like Seth Bling using it to make Super Mario World into Flappy Bird. Again, this is the work of wizards. My favorite use of Ace, though, has to be in Pokemon Yellow. It's just a normal credits warp, but it was so easy that 10 year old me was able to pull it off. Pretty much all you gotta do is turn off your game at a certain point while saving in order to corrupt your save file. This will allow you to use the menus to write your own code. Then you just do some not even that precise inputs in order to walk right out this door and into the end of the game. The Gen 1 Pokemon games in general are incredibly glitchy. These things are held together by duct tape and dreams with most glitches being just out of your way enough to not affect normal gameplay. It's not that hard though. Most people can do the setups fairly easily. So if you wanna break them, give it a try. I've got a list of glitches just because there's five new sips that choose and save corruption. Physically city poke merge and cloning. Skip the Pokedex, rob a vending machine. Level best 100 and a Pikachu off screen. But get break, get got out of the game. Pokemon, I think through the code and the cartridge too. Or just to find some weird sh to do, like walking through walls or getting hooked on Dragon Knight, breaking Route 6 and seeing the robber twice. This Hall of Fame corruption and skipping block, no bike cycling road or just having a full box. And the most famous glitch of all time, the one and only missing. No. While most of these glitches are just for fun, some of them do have practical use. For example, the Red Health glitch. When a player is at low HP, a certain sound will play to let them know. This sound though can cause other sound and animations to not be played, which makes the game just slightly faster. This makes the glitch perfect for speedrunners, and these people are f***ing terrifying. They can and will break any game. It would break the mother's neck for a 2 second time save. That super long Paper Mario glitch? Them of course! They learned how to read ASCII code just to do that. They also make use of what's probably the second most famous glitch of all time, the backwards long jump in Super Mario 64. Or the BLJ as most people call it. It allows you to skip the majority of the game, making it beatable in just under 5 minutes without collecting a single star. It works because of the way video games do speed. Basically, they give you a speed number that determines how fast you're going. And if you do something like a long jump that increases your speed, that speed gets added to your speed number. So to stop you from just continually long jumping to go infinitely fast, your speed number has a cap at a certain point. But when you're going backwards, your speed number goes negative. And Super Mario 64 forgot to cap how low your number can go. But if you just keep backwards long jumping, you'll get a burst of speed sending you backwards so fast the game can't process you're about to hit something. This allows you to go through doors or up the infinite staircase at the end of the game. With this and other technical glitches like Ace though, we eventually hit a wall. We can only manipulate the game so much, well inside the game itself. But what if we could go further? What if we could break free of the confines of the game and manipulate it in the real world? What if we could modify it? This requires not just pushing the game past what the developers intended, but past what it intends. Modifying its very cold to do deeds previously impossible. Where could someone even find the tools to do such a thing? That might just work. This is what's known as a cheat device, more specifically an action replay for the DS. When placed between a game and the console, it essentially acts like a more powerful version of Ace. Cutting out the lengthy, super precise setups, and instead of drinking code based solely off a series of numbers and letters entered before starting the game. With this, you can truly bust games open, allowing you to do things like give your character infinite lives, make them invincible, obtain all collectibles instantly, almost dastardly. You can make Mario jump higher. As a kid, me and my brother would use it to give ourselves a bunch of rare Pokemon. Or to access the previously mentioned in-person events without having to beg our parents to take us to them. My favorite though was always the one that let you catch other trainers Pokemon. Not being able to catch another trainer's Pokemon is a fundamental rule of the game. Hammered into you all throughout the game than the anime. So being able to do so is mind blowing. I had some good times with this thing. I up until my brother decided to trade our working action replay for friends that didn't. 
And no, I never figured out what the f*** is wrong with him. On the action replay for the DS, cheating devices have been around pretty much since the beginning of home gaming, with the earliest being the Game Genie for the Sega Genesis and NES. A fun fact about this is that Nintendo actually f***ing hated it. Nintendo was very protective of their IPs at the time. Okay, all the times. But because of it, they actually took the Game Genie's creator Galoob to court, claiming that it infringed their copyright by modifying their code. They famously ended up losing though, because Galoob wasn't actually selling anything that Nintendo had copyrighted. If they were making their own already modified games and selling those, that would be a different story. But if you wanted to use the Game Genie, you had to already own a copy of the game you wanted to use it on. To help you understand, I called my friend copyright lawyer Michelangelo to explain it. Hi. I'm copyright lawyer Michelangelo, and here I've got a game. Now, nah, it's a pretty good game, but I just like to modify it a bit. Now, because I own the game, I'm free to do this. I can even sell rocks to other people who want to modify their games. But, if I started making my own pre rock games and selling them, then I'd go from lawyer to felon, and not in a fun way. Wow, thanks copyright lawyer Michelangelo. But this brings up the question of, if they're perfectly legal, why don't we see them anymore? I used to see action replays in Toys R Us all the time, and using one so much, when the 3DS came out, I wanted one for that. But it never came. This is because while game companies couldn't make them outright illegal, they could stop them from working on their consoles. And there was an increased desire to do so because of the rise of competitive gaming. Back in the day, you hack in a magic up with Hyper Beam, use it against your friends, and you all have a good laugh. Nowadays, with the rise of competitive Pokemon, if you even think about hacking in a perfectly normal Pokemon just to save time on training it, some guy halfway across the world is gonna tell you to kill yourself. Of course, so that is one of the tamer examples of hacking in video games. And there is definitely a difference between playing against your friends and playing against some random guy online. When you're playing against your friends, you're talking and interacting in real time. You can immediately recognize their hacking and have a good laugh about it. When you're playing against some random police online though, there is no interaction. You're just trying to play normally, and then this faceless entity appears and stops you from doing that. There's also the fact that when you're playing against your friends, you're just playing to have fun. When you're playing competitively though, you're playing to win. You're playing to rank up, or in some cases, you're playing in a tournament with thousands of dollars on the line. You don't want that taken away from you just because some kid went to Walmart. So while it's sad to see the fun aspect of cheating taken away, it's a necessary sacrifice for competitive gaming to exist as it does. That doesn't mean you won't lose to some kid with hacks though. There's always some guy with aim bars to shoot for them, or x-rays to see through walls, or wall hacks to shoot through the walls. Or maybe they just decide to become downright invincible. All this is like playing against a broken character on steroids. Having abilities far beyond anything you could get through normal gameplay. Now consoles do try to mitigate this by making it so that you can only download their official software. It's like how you need the PlayStation Store or the Nintendo eShop to download a game and you can't just put in a USB and download it from there. But there is still a never ending arms race between hackers trying to get their software on the consoles and the consoles trying to keep it off. And in this arms race, I'm on the side of the hackers. Mostly because while they may try to cheat at games, there are even more people who just want to do cool s*** with it. Once you can put your own software onto a system, you can do so much. This is where you get people modding multiplayer into single player games like Breath of the Wild and Mario Odyssey. Or using Pokéhex to add any Pokémon they want to their save file. And then they get caught a b*** for it. I don't do much modding, but depending on who's watching, I may or may not have modded my 3DS, and it may or may not have been surprisingly easy, but if I did do it, I did it so that I could play Pokemon Renegade Platinum, a fan-made, improved version of Pokemon Platinum, on real hardware. And I could do so much more than that. I could take pretty much any game for the Game Boy, SNES, NES, and more, and just put it on my 3DS. Or beyond just games, I could change the system themes. I could take save files from my cartridges, and dump them to my PC to use on an emulator. I could even download a full, fan-made port of GTA 3 for the 3DS. Allegedly, of course, hypothetically speaking. And if I did mod my 3DS, it's not even like I just did it so I could download games for free. With the 3DS eShop closing, all the games that you could only get through it were completely lost. Unless you have a modded 3DS, then you can still download 
any of them. We are still Hindu though. By the fact that to do any of this, you have to find a way to get a console to accept your code. But where this restriction does not exist is on PC, where you can run anything you want. And if you want to mod a game, you don't gotta worry about injecting code into the file, because you just have the file. It's right here for you to start doing cool stuff with it. And this is where we can go from breaking a game to shattering it. Remember using out of bounds glitches to see places you shouldn't be able to? Old news, you can just take the camera and put it wherever you want. Or maybe you don't like a particular piece of jank. Just remove it. This character can now run faster or jump higher. Or we can start looking into how games tick and just dump entire assets. Or how about the time people looked through the files of Mario 64, found all the assets for a scrapped, playable version of Luigi, and modded him back into the game as if he had always been there. Do game companies want you doing this? Hell no. That's why when you download a game, it's only in machine code. Code a computer can read, but not a human. But that hasn't stopped people from using software by the NSA to reverse engineer Mario 64's entire source code from machine code. You see this? This is the code that makes the BLJ work. Or it could be for the camera, I can't actually read source code. You can even take a file from your computer and put it back onto a cartridge. This is how you get all those suspiciously cheap copies of rare games on eBay. That's how I got my copy of Pokemon Emerald as a kid. And it looks just like the original. Well, almost just like. I can't transfer Pokemon to the DS games. If I save in a dark cave, the screen has a freakout. And it can do this. Chaos Control! Where'd you go? I don't want to talk about it. When think back to the physical world, they don't get any less crazy. Of course we have basic things, like using a controller with a turbo button, allowing holding down a button to register as rapidly pressing it. But how about filing down your D-pad to make turning in Super Mario Kart better, which is an actual thing in speedruns. And this isn't even the widest thing speedrunners have come up with. Japanese Dragon Quest 3 speedrunners learned that they could cause certain glitches to occur by changing the conductivity of the copper in their Famicons. And the way they did this was apparently by putting their systems on hot plates. I f***ing knew it would work! There were also Battle for Bikini Bottom speedruns, where a key part of the run used to be using a technique called lag clips. Basically, you pause and unpause the game while ramming SpongeBob into something you want to clip through in order to cause the disk drive to choke and hopefully clip through it. But this was only possible on certain Xbox models, with disk drives slow enough to create the lag, is what everyone thought, until they realized that runners Swag Master Doritos had just been doing them the whole time on the wrong Xbox model. No one, including Swag Master, knew how he was doing it, until one of the shift discovered that if you gunked up your disk in certain positions, you could create lag on different Xbox models. And sure enough, Swag Master Doritos had been licking his f***ing disk clean. Look at this thing. This looks like it should be buried in a lead line box, not getting sloppy toppy. But this technique never saw much use though. Because shortly after, speedrun moderators decided to allow players to mod their Xboxes and directly boot Battle for Bikini Bottom from the hard drive. This made lag clips completely impossible by cutting out the disk drive. But by allowing players to run the game from their hard drive, the load times were so much shorter that the run was still faster, even without lag clips. But this decision didn't come out of nowhere. Allowing players to load their game from their hard drive was something the community had discussed for years. So why they suddenly decide to allow it after a big breakthrough in lag clips? Well, that's because it wasn't just the gunk that made the lag clips possible. There were super fine points on the disc that had to be gunked up for the lag clips to be optimal. And to do this, the best way was actually to scratch the disc. And the best disc drive for these new lag clips would also naturally scratch the disc over time. You can even see this on Swagmaster Doritos disc under all the... Ugh. And while speed one is all absolute lunatics, they got that way because of a love for their game. And when you love a game, you don't want to see it reach the final layer of brokenness. Complete death. This layer is exactly what it sounds like. 
Whether it's completely destroyed or something more subtle, the game is broken. And it can't be played anymore. We've all experienced it at some point. My most personal moment was with my copy of Mario Kart Wii. After playing it for dozens of hours, my dad put the disc in, we got to the stage select screen, and then... <laughs> and it can happen to anyone too. Sure, if you treat your games poorly, it's more likely to happen, but... Games are fragile, and sometimes they just... break. If you live in a humid place and don't touch your games for a while, they can completely corrode through without you realizing. And sometimes games themselves have design flaws that limit their life expectancy. A lot of older cartridge games have batteries in them used for save data. And over time, these batteries run dry and when they do, you lose your save. When I was trying to play Pokemon Yellow as a kid, I was forced to confront the fact that no matter how far I got, I couldn't make it to the end before my save data deleted itself and I'd have to start over. Then there's consoles themselves that exist on a timer. The NES famously had a design flaw where because you put the games in and press them down like a VHS tape, the pins are constantly getting bent. And as they get bent out of shape, it gets harder and harder for the NES to read games until it just can't. Or how about the Xbox 360 and the infamous red ring of death? The system uses red lights to show when something's wrong with it. And if you have three red lights, that means there's a hardware failure. While some swear by DIY solutions like wrapping it in a towel and letting it overheat, with hundreds of moving parts in a 360, there was no one solution for everything. And sometimes it just had to be replaced. But looking through the layers of brokenness, it's clear to see that for every downside, there is a silver lining. Jane can hurt a game, but it can also bring a lot of hurt to it. Glitches can make games less playable, and also allow you to have fun in ways you couldn't without them. And hacking can be used to give players an unfair advantage, but at the same time, it can be used to fully understand games, and do so much with them. And maybe this layer is no different. Sure it was sad when our copy of Mario Kart Wii broke, but it led my family to start playing Skylanders together. Maybe a family's NES breaking led them to get an SNES, and experience a whole new generation of games. And maybe even just hearing about the Red Ring of Death could have led someone to not make the mistake of buying a 360 and led them to the far superior PS3. With that in mind, am I upset that my NES is broken? No. Because like I said, I was right! It did make it faster! Even my kitchen's faster now that it's hot. I haven't cooked eggs this quickly in years.